All right, welcome to Talking Giants bye week edition, a little bye week special. Last year, we actually had on Justin and his uh, partner, David Powers, for their, from their Bleeding Blue podcast. And look at us now. We're both hosting the podcast together. This year, we're doing a little something special again with my, two of my favorite uh, New York Giants content creators, with Chris the Entertainer from the Entertainer Talking uh, Talkin Sports channel, and then Mike from the Mike Too Nice, uh, Mike Too Mean Sometimes channel. Wow, yeah. <laughs> Chris, Mike, I know we were just talking about the NBA draft for like 10 minutes before this, so I won't ask you about that, but I'll I'll start with you, Mike. What's going on, my man? I'm good. I'm good. Um, you know, it's it's hard to find time with you two these days. I started working and uh it's just my life is such a blur these days, but I don't have the free time I used to, which could be a good thing or a bad thing, but I am keeping busy, so I really can't complain too much. Yeah, it's a it's a good grind. And then uh for Mike, we're going to put on his channel. Like, this is all going to come at the same time. We're going to be talking about Joe Judge and then the future of the wide receiver spot and the cornerback spot for the New York Giants. So we'll be talking about that on his channel. Um, we'll obviously plug that all at the end. And then we got Chris the Entertainer. I mean, like I said, I got the two kings of YouTube right on, on here right now. What's going on, Chris? I appreciate you guys having me on, man. You know, I had a really fun time the first time I got to work with you guys. I've had you, Bobby, on the channel a number of times. Of course, Mike and myself, we've been working together um yeah i'm excited to jump into it man of course i'm all smiles right now i mean two wins in a row we're going for our third straight for the first time since 2016 <laughs> and uh we just knocked off the philadelphia eagles i mean we haven't done that i think since i don't know about 1800 so we're, you know I, we're, we're looking good right now at the bye we got we actually have an opportunity to make the playoffs it, it's crazy and we we do feel good but and you know little behind the scenes we're recording this on thursday so it was a few days early um I mean, we win, they beat the Eagles for the first time in four years, and then it's like, oh, our kicker gets extended, and then gets COVID, and then DeAndre Baker's found innocent, and then Mark Colombo gets fired. I mean, it's been a, it's been like a, like the, it's went kind of downhill, but also like uphill at the same time this week. So pretty, pretty slow news week since, um, since and we welcome all Justin Penick to the kind show. of departed. Oh yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Hi, Justin. I I thought you were going to forget about me, uh, Bobby. Sorry. Uh, Chris, Chris has been uh, trying to invite me on his channel um, for a couple months now, basically since the season has started. And if I were Chris, I would start to get eerily suspicious that I don't like him, but that's not the case. My Wi-Fi has just been terrible, and I'm, uh, I am I have fixed. So, Chris, I'm, I'm coming on. All coming right. On. I, I, I'm looking forward to it. I'm invite. I mean, I am inviting myself on the channel after you, <laughs> after you invited me three times and I said no. Um, hi everyone. This is a uh, this is nice. Thank you. For, thank you for joining us. We're going to be uh, also on Chris's channel uh, at the same time, the Entertainers channel, same time, uh, and we're having a bi week roundtable discussion. It's a lot of fun. Uh, Bobby Skinner. One of our first topics is uh, Daniel Jones. Danny Daniel Dimes. Jones. Daniel Jones, and which. The quarterback will always be the topic of every football. Team. It's usually going to be the most talked about, whether it's good or bad. And this year, it's been a little bit, a mix of both. After a rookie year, that was kind of a mix of both, but you felt good after the rookie season. And we'll get into some stuff. And I, I talked to both of you guys individually to ask your opinions about stuff. Um, Chris, I want to throw it to you because I, I mean, I'll give a basis on where I stand with Jones. Is I, I'm a Jones believer. I do believe in Jones. I think he's got everything that you need like I don't think he has a Patrick Mahomes arm or stuff but I, I think he's got everything plus the work ethic which I, I really do think people forget like the work ethic to get better you see his footwork is better but anyways I've done some homework and I, I've been critical of Jason Garrett this year and we actually got a lot more I know it's been good the past couple weeks and Mike me and you share this sentiment of like hey we think this guy's a downfield guy when he's attacking downfield may not be perfect and there may be mistakes but he seems to be better that way and honestly, the mistakes have been there this year with this conservative offense. And I mean, I did a little homework. I went through every game and on plays where there's two routes that go 15 plus yards, um, Jones on the season is 66.7% uh, completion percentage. So two out of every three on 108 plays like that. Uh, three touchdowns, three interceptions. I mean, the touchdown interception ratio looks bad no matter what kind of play we're running this year. People, yeah, in, nine. people in analytics say that doesn't matter. So ignore it, touchdown. It does matter. It, do, it does yeah, matter. I, yeah. I, <laughs> 9.84 9 yards per attempt and then an 11 percent sack rate 12 plays and then on plays where there's only one or none plays that are 15 uh, 15 plus yard routes 256 plays 62.2 percent so a little over four percent less five touchdowns six interceptions 4.94 yards per attempt half 
18 sacks, which is a 7% sack rate, so 4% less. So with that in mind, Chris, I don't I mean I'm, I don't want to break down this, but I just I just want to get that out there because I've been working I, I, on I, that. That's that some very uh, interesting numbers that you came up with there. Uh, it, yeah, I think people I think people mistake what I'm saying with this is that I want a, like a, a downfield attack to be like that means we're just gunslinging, throwing the ball deep 20 times a game. That's not what I mean. It's honestly something like the Chargers are running with Herbert. I mean, you saw a lot of people did not like Justin Herbert at Oregon. And then the like the talk has been this year. It's like he got out of a horizontal offense and got into a vertical offense and it's unlocked him. Um, and I think the mistake of Jason Garrett this year is looking at them. They went, they looked at the mistakes he made last year and said, we got to change all this, make it everything closer to the line of scrimmage so the mistakes aren't there and have a pre-snap offense. Where in my mindset, I look at the strengths and say, let's get better the strengths and lower the weaknesses, but let's play to your strengths. And I feel like they haven't done that. Um, but Chris. I'll kick it to you. And like I said, you don't even need, like, we don't even need, I'm not even asking you to talk about those numbers and what yeah, type yeah, of yeah. offense. But I mean, what are your overall takes on Daniel Jones um, a little over a year and a half into, or a year and a half into his career? Yeah. Uh, I'll start with the Jason Garrett thing. Um, I, I personally think that Jason Garrett, much like we've said with Daniel Jones, I think his hands were tied to start the year. I think he was dealt a very unfair advantage being that the pandemic and, you know, people didn't have a normal enough time to learn the offense, the offensive line. I don't care who the OC was the first four weeks. The offense is not moving with the way that that offensive line was blocking, in my opinion. And I think that had a lot to do with why there were short routes because he didn't feel comfortable uh, that the offensive line could hold blocks for him to be able to try to throw more shots down the field. I do think over the last three, four weeks, you've started to see the offense open up. You're seeing Jones take more shots down the field against the Bucks game in particular. That was Jones's, Worst game of the year, but they did take a lot of shots. Um, and I and I do think that they've been taking some shots in these games recently. I think they've opened up the playbook a bit. As far as Jones goes, man, I try to be, I try to be even keel with Jones. I've never gotten, in my opinion, I don't try to get too high or too low on him. I still think he needs a lot more time to evaluate. I'm certainly not giving up on him, and he's played much better these last two weeks. And to me, the most important thing for a quarterback is what he's been able to do the last two weeks not lose the football game. Don't turn the football over. That is the objective number one for a quarterback. And then you build off of that. But that is one thing I've been very encouraged by because coming into that week, he had only one time throughout his entire career where he had no turnovers in a football game. Now he's done it two weeks in a row. So that alone shows progression. And the thing that I love about the overall offense, and I think it's benefited Jones, is the fact they've gotten back to running the football. They're averaging 29 carries over the last seven contests. Their previous 19 contests before that, they were averaging 22 carries. That's a huge disparity. You're talking about seven different, seven more times you're running the football. I think it's helped open up the passing game. It's made it more opportunistic for Jones. He's been, you know, I think he's been more efficient because of it. And they're not turning the ball over as much. And that's what I want, man. I want a balanced offense at the end of the day. I think a good ground game is going to allow the New York Giants to be able to hit some big shots down the field. And I think that's what they're trying to do. I'm encouraged by Jones. I'm definitely aboard the Daniel Jones train for 2021, as long as he could keep this going. I really never wavered. You know, I always try to be fair, but I, I, I'm definitely sticking behind Daniel Jones. And yeah, I want him to be our quarterback in 2021. I think he's going to have a strong finish. Said that from the beginning of the year, not just with Jones, but the entire team. I thought the last eight to 10 games, you'd really start to see this team improve. And so far they have. Before I kick it to Mike, I'll ask you. Now, it seems like we're playing our, ourselves out of the top five. Um, this season, I, th I think that was a talking point going into this year. It's like, well, if you play yourself into the top two, top three, then you know what? You're not, you haven't played good enough to not draft a QB. But I was with his play, if you have the second pick, so let's just, you know, mm -hmm. cut Trevor Lawrence out of the, uh, out of the talk. And I actually haven't like really looked at any of the QBs. I try, I like to wait till after the year. So it's less of like outside voices. And she's like, all right, let me just go watch all these guys' games in a row. But anyways, say, just say you really did like Fields or Wilson or Lance. And we had the second pick. Would you – like, where would you stand at the quarterback? Would it be like, I think we should tra get one? Would it be like a, a battle in your head of like, should we move on? Should we pick one? Or, or where would you be? First thing I got to ask myself, if, if I'm asking whether or not it's likely, is Gettleman still here? Because if Gettleman's not still here, that obviously opens up the possibility. Let's say that no. Gettleman's not – okay. So that opens up the possibility that we would take a quarterback. Um we, first off, we're not going to have the second pick. I literally think it is a 0% chance we're going to have the second pick. Because damn the, Jaguars, right. the Jaguars have the one win right now, right? The Jaguars only have one win. I don't see them winning more than two more games, and I don't see the Giants losing out. So I don't think the Giants are going to have a top, probably even four pick. I, I think we're going to be fifth or lower 
That's why I'm almost certain, in my opinion, we won't be taking a quarterback. And even if we had the second pick at this point, I'm probably still not taking a quarterback. I'm trying to fill the rest of the holes on this roster. If anything, I want to try to trade down out of that pick, accumulate more assets. That's my opinion. I think we need to build the rest of this roster. I think if you get Barkley back and he's fully healthy, you get Jones a weapon. This offensive line, I think, has shown enough maturity to where I could buy in to the, that this offense could get the job done in 2021. Yeah, I think I tend to agree with you. And like I guess I'll send it to you, Mike. But the point really, one, I, I like Jones. Like, admittedly, I like Jones. Um, but a trade down, because if, if this QB class is as covered as people say, you can trade down from two. And we'll talk about later about free agency and stuff. This team has holes. And a trade down, it would do wonders for this team. And it's like, you know, it's, it's not like who do you get, Chase or Sewell or part like – you just like, all right, who are we getting here? And then who are we get the next? Like, it's like, who are we, who's filling cornerback two? Who's filling wide receiver? Who's filling this? So, cornerback two. Cornerback two. We're, we're <laughs> going to talk about that on Mike's channel. Mike, I'll get it to you. You're critical, and I, and I like that about you. And there's a lot of people who are jerks. I think you do a good job for the most part of like not being critical just for the sake of being critical and not like, I know, like, there's people I know who want Jones to fail because they don't like Gettleman and they know if, Jones doesn't fail, get him to stay. I don't think you're like that. So where do you stand at the quarterback spot right now? Yeah, if I was like that, it'd be miserable. But um, <clears throat> honestly, look, I, I have my concerns. I'll probably be the most pessimistic one out of the four of us on Jones. And I think that's fair based on what we've seen so far. Um, but I will admit he's done a lot of good things. He's he's very fast. I think we both, we all know that. Like the guy can take a read option to the house, which is nice. Hopefully he stays on his feet, you know, but um, <laughs> he's done some really nice things. The ball accuracy, I think he can read a defense pretty well. And you talked about the work ethic. That's very important. I think he has like basically all the makeup you want as a, franchise quarterback personality wise work ethic all those things but the concerns are still there because like the ball security I mean the last two games take those out I mean I guess we can include them but still it hasn't been consistent all year um he needs to fix that for sure I think we all know that but you know even the arm strength thing is a concern for me of course I know it's not the biggest deal in the world but it kind of limits his upside and my concern for Daniel Jones and this is kind of what I said on draft night back in 2019 is that I don't think I ever said Daniel Jones completely sucks but at the same time I don't think I'll ever be really good or great I don't see him being a top 10 quarterback so like my concern is do we have the next Andy Dalton Kirk Cousins Alex Smith where you can't really win a Super Bowl with this guy unless you have everything around them perfect and like it's possible for sure but you're kind of like handicapping yourself in a way and making sure the rest of your roster is completely perfect so that's my problem with Jones now I do want to see how these last six games play out of course because we're trending in the right direction right now which is great I want Jones to be the guy because I've always said if he is the guy the Giants have so many more options you know in this draft they can fill a position of need they don't have to reach on another quarterback again and like I don't know what, how I feel about this you know quarterback class I do love Trey Lance of course and Trevor Lawrence um, I don't know how I feel about Fields and Wilson but for your question with the second overall pick assuming Gettleman's gone that question will be there and if the Giants do have the second overall pick even the third overall pick it's probably going to come at the expense of Jones not playing well the final six games of the year. So that will kind of be answered for us already. Maybe you have more answers there, but I do want to see how it plays out. But if Jones does play the way he did last week, or, you know, I think he played his best game of the year against the Eagles last week. If he played like that more consistently, um, I think we would have our franchise quarterback. Now, can he do it consistently? I don't know, but if he can do that, then I think that's our guy. But I think right now it'd be a little premature to just reach on a quarterback in April. I think I do want to see how this plays out, but I do have my concerns it's definitely there for me but um based on what we saw on sunday i'm a bit more optimistic right now you've said in the past that your player comp for him is alex wilson and i've smith. excuse, excuse sorry, me Al alex wilson <laughs> <laughs> whoops alex smith um kind of looks like alex wilson but alex smith um and i i've i think we've actually talked about this. I, I agree with you and disagree with you on that where i think like talent wise like, like personality-wise, I think he is the same as Alex Smith. Like, arm strength, accuracy, ability to move. Um, Mechanics, Smith. yeah. The difference, I think, is the mindset. Where we saw last year, and this year it seems like they're trying to beat it out. And Jones is a guy who likes to go downfield and sit in the pocket and take shots. Where Alex Smith has kind of been the opposite of his career. Where it's like, yeah, he's going to manage the game, but he's never going to – like, there's been times where it's like, you need to take that shot, and Alex Smith doesn't. Um, with – is I mean, what do you – what do you, like like – so you were mentioning, like, is he the next Andy Dalton, blah, blah. What would you just say, like, his, like, player comp would be, like, if, like, like a, for a player, like, maybe a high and a low one? 
Hmm. Yeah, I mean, like the best case scenario, I guess. I mean, I don't even know, honestly, you're putting me on the spot here, but like I, I hear people say Matt Ryan. I, I don't really see that one, to be honest with you. The mobility is nowhere near each other. The arm strength is not really, you know, the same in my opinion. So I don't I guess you can say an Alex Smith that takes more deep shots. I, I think we can go with that. I do agree that the other things I was saying about Alex Smith are true about him, but, you know, mentality wise, when he goes deep, I don't see Alex Smith. So that's kind of a different thing. So we could say an Alex Smith that takes more chances, which was kind of the more of the KC version. I mean, didn't, he didn't take that many deep shots, but still if Jones can be a bit more aggressive, then he'll have a higher ceiling than that for sure. But I mean, I think just looking at him and seeing how his career might project out going forward, I do see Alex Smith though, who might, take a little more chances what about big ben like that's a comparison and danny king our um you know who works with us after the draft he was like he, he's like i see big ben and the more i see it obviously I'm, this isn't me saying like he's gonna have the career of big ben because big ben's put a, together a hall of fame career not to say he can't but I, I see big ben and someone who doesn't have like the craziest arm in the world but has accuracy will stand in there will have those laugh out loud turnovers and moments <laughs> um and He's faster than Big Ben, but kind of like, you know, the ability to scramble around like like Big Ben. Um, that That's to me is, is my like my player comp for Jones. And like I said, that's that's an upside one. And then my worry, though, is with Garrett, and I, I'll kick it to Justin on this, is that he's trying to turn him into Alex Smith, where it's yeah. like we talked about on the, on the show that came out on, on Thursday, and Justin made a great point. I'll kick it to him this. He's like, Jones kind of played a perfect game and had a 34-yard touchdown run versus the Eagles, we scored 27 points, which, like, it's a good game, but it's, like, a perfect game. You should have, like, a game against, like, Washington last year where he has five touchdowns and, you know, 42 points. Like, that should be – that should, it should be what happens in a perfect game, not 27 points, which some teams are putting up every single week. Justin? It, yeah, and, Chris, I'll, I'll throw this back to you because I kind of want to get to asking a question about almost of – roster construction and expectations that you expect out of a quarterback in today's NFL. Yeah. Cause I think uh, so much of it has changed since Eli has been quarterback. And I think tour is after we won our second Super Bowl, because basically the, the, the second Super Bowl was won with the arm of Eli Manning. It wasn't the, you know, uh, uh, the defense that had an incredible postseason run. It wasn't just the offensive line and the run game. I mean, that offensive line he carries, was bad. He carries that. Yeah. yeah. So and I, I feel like even after that, you saw Joe Flacco go on an incredible run. Yes, that defense was great. But Flacco went on the incredible run. You've seen the dominance of Brady. You've seen Breeze. You've seen the, the stellar – Rodgers, you've seen the stellar elite quarterbacks – win the Super Bowl. You have seen some average quarterbacks make the Super Bowl, but it has been the quarterbacks that have been playing out of their minds, at least for that postseason run, that have won the Super Bowl. So even, I, you know, and why I bring this up with Jones, and Mike, this is kind of related to your point as well. You know, what, are we, what do we expect out of Daniel Jones and the quarterback position for the New York football giants? Are we, are we, do we really feel like, in today's NFL, number one, and with this Giants team, number two, that we need a guy that's going to be a Mahomes, take it over, take over the game, and and be that, and be the dude, be the guy, and the make it happen phrase that so many fans have said this year. So, Chris, you know, I'll kind of Landry let you. Shaman said that for the Nets. <laughs> New Nets. His, his like most recent tweet was like, "You just got to make it happen." So, Chris, so I'll let you run with this in terms of more. This, I guess, this is more of like a philosophical question. On yeah. What you um... think. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, now, going back to the player comp, I see Ryan Tannehill. And, I, and a lot of people brought that up about Jones when he was drafted. I really see that. And Tannehill's matured into becoming a very good quarterback. Um, but he, he has a, a good team around him. I see that a lot with Jones. That, that's the type of quarterback that I see. Maybe a little Tony Romo with a little more running ability. But I, I, I see Tannehill. Um, as far as what I expect, yeah, it's definitely a different game. But I say it all the time. Pat Mahomes doesn't grow on trees. And Pat Mahomes is in the perfect situation. You have the greatest offensive mind since I've been watching football as his head coach. You've got more weapons than anybody knows what to do with. Pat Mahomes and that situation don't grow on trees. The New York Giants, the way I look at it is, I'm not going to try to fight fire with fire because our fire is never going to be as good as Kansas City's fire. So I don't believe in trying to build a team the same way Kansas City is playing because I don't think we're ever going to be able to go tit for tat with them. I don't think we're going to be able to get into shootouts and beat teams like that. 
The way you beat a team like that is the way the New York Giants beat the New England Patriots by grounding the ball, having a quarterback that can make plays when they need to be made and being strong in the trenches, have a strong defensive line, have a strong offensive line. Even though that might be old school, that's what I believe in. I don't think you can get into shootouts with teams like that and win football games in the long run. Maybe you could go on a run. It's possible. But for long-term success, I believe in building in the trenches uh, and winning up at the point of attack and having a balanced offense. I like a balanced offense. You guys brought up the Giants only had 27 points this week. I'm okay with that. The reason they only had 27 points, in my opinion, was because of how often they ran the football. They chewed up the clock. They run the, they run the ball 36 times. When's the last time the New York Giants run the ball 36 mm-hmm. times? Um, I'm completely fine with that. I'm completely fine playing in the low to mid, uh, mid twenties. If you're chewing up the clock and keeping that offense off the field. So that's how I believe you beat those teams. And when you have a double digit lead too, that's yeah. the thing, you know, when you, when you're not playing from behind in games. And I think that's what you brought up that great stat about how there's basically been a seven carry difference the last couple of weeks versus the first half of the season. And basically the difference is, is that even though the giants blew some of those leads, they did have double digit leads in the second half. So um, I think that's, that's a great point, Mike. I want to hear about your, your philosophical thinking about how to, how to build a franchise and how you would do it and what kind of quarterback you feel you need. Do you need the, the elite kind of quarterback to, to get to not just make the Super Bowl but also win the big game as well? Uh, yeah, I would say so, especially in today's NFL. Um, you know, as you said, Mahomes is are not going to grow on trees. I, I get it for sure. But you also need a quarterback that can make the players around him better, can improvise, has incredible pocket awareness and and things like that. And I, I don't know if Jones has all those things. He definitely has some of those things. But I just don't see Daniel Jones as a put the team on my back when other people are struggling type quarterback, like we saw Eli Manning do back in 2011. So, you know, I have those concerns, of course, but like, I guess there are instances like, you know, Blake Bortles was a bad penalty away from making a Super Bowl. We saw Jimmy Garoppolo do it. How about it Peyton Manning? People don't Peyton think Manning. about it. 2015 Peyton Manning yeah. was horrible. He was like, my thing is I don't want that Brock to be the goal Osweiler. though. You know? No, 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 of course not. Of course not. I would love to have Pat Mahomes and have a great team around him. Um, <laughs> And by no means am I saying you don't need a quarterback who can make plays and put the team on his back. You need that. When I say – I'm saying I don't need Aaron Rodgers. I don't need Pat Mahomes. I don't need Russell Wilson. It would be nice to have those guys, but I still think if you build the team the proper way, you could beat those guys. That was, that was the reason on draft night I was so pissed off because I'm like, first off, you took him six overall. In my heart, I felt like they could have got him later. But like, you're kind of just like limiting yourself. Like you're not shooting for upside. Like you're not, like I never saw Daniel Jones as a great quarterback and had the potential to be great. There are quarterbacks that I looked at, even Drew Locke, who's turned out to be terrible, but he had the tools to be great in my opinion. So there are quarterbacks in this upcoming draft that have those tools. Trey Lance being one of them, who I think can maybe be like a Deshaun Watson type, everything breaks perfect for him. But I thought if things broke perfectly for Daniel Jones you're still looking at a mid-tier quarterback which was the reason I was upset and I hope he exceeds my expectations because I'm fine eating crow but like you know so far I've seen too many inconsistencies to really you know buy into that well yeah. I'll, I'll I'll ask you two questions that first like what do you think Locke has that that Jones doesn't have because I think Jones is more accurate he's he's faster Locke has a, I'd say Locke has a stronger arm but I don't think it's like I don't think Locke has some like rocket arm either Yeah, no, I I did like the arm strength, his ability to throw on the run. He doesn't take as many sacks. You can maybe blame the offensive lines in that situation, but I think his pocket awareness is better as well. Those are really the main three things for me. I mean, look, it's close. It's not like Drew Locke was up here and Jones was down there, but at the same time, if I had to pick in a vacuum back in that 2019 draft, I probably would have taken Locke, honestly. What would Jones have to do to be like, okay, like he's a a top 10 QB, obviously besides like five years of consistently being a top 10 QB. Right. Um, I mean, is it the turnovers? Because I I view tur- turnovers are an issue, obviously. But I also, like, I don't view every turnover the same. Like, Jones has literally cut the fumbles in half this year. And I never, and I never like, the fumbles suck. And because of his rookie year, every fumble will be amplified that much. And, and that's just d- rightfully so because of that f- rookie year was all-time bad. But I don't look at every turnover the same. Like, I look at that turnover versus Steeler, Steelers. And I, I, I brought this point up a million times is that interception is like, yeah, you know, throw it away, take the sack. But if he had that mindset, we're not down that field. I mean, there was four or five throws on that drive where he hung in there and he hung in there and he hung in there and he threw off his back foot and complete a pass and we don't move that drive on. And then I look at the Bears game the next week where it's like, oh, if he just takes sex, like, well, that 97-yard drive we have, it started with him being tackled and flipping it up to Lewis. And without that, we're punting the ball instead of scoring, 
you know, 10 plays later. Um, though now the ones I have an issue with the Tampa ones, yeah. um, the Tampa game, I had never been more dejected with Jones. I was just like, I don't get it. The mistakes don't make no sense. I had to and talk you down from the ledge. I had to talk you down from that ledge. That, that I just, I, I, I had never been so like pessimistic since he's been the quarterback. Like, like, um, that game made me feel horrible. Now the past couple of games have been all right. Washington was, you know, it was nothing special, but it was a good step in the right direction after that Tampa game. Um, but then you look o- overall, he has the best deep passer rating in the NFL. Now, part of that, a big part of that is we don't go downfield. We don't go downfield, but it does show that when we do do it, he's capable. Yeah. So, yes. what, so I just asked you a question, Mike, and then gave you a 10 minute answer. Yeah. What would he yeah, have to do you- <laughs> to be a, te- to be a top 10 QB for you? <laughs> yeah. No, you bring up that stat. Um, look, I think the main thing I would, have, I would have two things. I need the pocket awareness to be better. Cause you know, when I go back and watch the film and stuff, I see too many instances of like one side of the pocket will break down and he kind of like continues to step into it. And I'm like, I know your eyes are downfield, but have more of a feel for it and kind of break out one way or another. So like, I want to see more of that to extend plays. He does a good job of extending plays on certain you know certain times but too many times a guy like Daniel Jones with his type of mobility and speed I don't think should be taking as many in pocket sacks if that makes sense you know what I mean so I th- I wish he was better at maneuvering the pocket a bit more is that fixable maybe we'll have to see but also you said the deep ball accuracy was good I, I just see too many instances of where it's missed I need that to be more consistent if he fixes the pocket awareness and the uh, deep ball accuracy I'll change my opinion and say this guy can be top 10 but I just of course need to see it happen first and Chris uh, you go yeah. I, I just wanted to, I, you, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, no, you go ahead, and then maybe I just wanted to question. point out two things that I've noticed in Jones this year that are I think are improvements over last year, um, and more specifically the last two weeks. But uh, overall, with the fumbling problem, I do think I could visibly see, especially last game when they ran those RPOs near the goal line, when he was spinning and getting hit, you could see that he was do. You know, he he definitely. Uh, is done a better job and you could see that he's practiced on that in terms of fumbling the football. So I think that's been a massive improvement. The other thing I've noticed the last two weeks, he's been really good with the hard counts. And, and to me, that shows some progression there as well. And I've seen a lot more audibles as well. It seems yes. like he's getting better at reading the opposing defense over the last couple of weeks. And this is where we talk about uh, Bobby's talked about how Tony Romo's like, ha- was like the offensive coordinator of the Dallas offense. And it was almost definitely more of Romo's play than the scheme that almost made that Cowboys offense as good as it was for many, many years. While even though they were still very good, a lot of Cowboy fans still complained that it, that it could have been better. And we are seeing why they complained, even though they would rank top five, top 10 consistently in, in those, in those uh, pure uh, yards numbers. But um, if Jones can take the reins a little bit, and that play to Deion Lewis that, you know, when he motioned him out to right. that, to that left sideline and he had that cadence at the line of scrimmage, that was one of the most impressed. That was, uh, you know, combine that with throwing to the sideline deep, which is he's had poor numbers throwing to the sideline and outside the hashes. Audibling at the line of scrimmage, uh, that was a really, really cool play. Bobby, do you want to move to a, a, a little, a little Dalvin Tomlinson, Leonard Williams talk? Do you have? Yes, I just want to answer my question too is. Wow. That is my answer for what he does. He need to be to be a top ten QB. Is he has to be someone, and I and this is where I believe in him. And I think, like you guys do your homework, but I think like just regular, you know, people who, people who aren't psychos about this team and break down every game like like we do. Like we're the crazy people. I, I always try to like <laughs> r- remind people, like we're we're the nuts. Like don't don't think that you're a nut for not knowing, you know, Kevin Zeitler's pass set rate. You know, um, I think that. But that's the answer for me to be a top ten QB is to be someone. Who's like, okay, they're doing this. I need to talk all of that. And that's why I got so jazzed up from that Dion Lewis play. It's like, this wasn't just a, you see one thing in Audible. This is like forcing them to show what you're doing and changing. And then on top of that, the pretty throw. Justin, now let's right. get into what Justin. Well, one other thing I want to bring up, because I'm thinking of a quarterback as you're saying that. Tom Brady didn't have the greatest physical attributes. He was a brilliant, brilliant quarterback. He was great at reading the line of scrimmage. And, he, and I'm not saying Dan Jones could become that, but it goes to show you if you're smart and you grow and you learn how to read defenses, you don't need, you can have, I guess, physical limitations and still be a great quarterback. I'm not saying that he'll do that, but it's not like it's unheard of. And if you could get better at that, like you said, you could see a lot more growth. And I think people that, discount that sorry. type of playing stuff. So I'll let you go. I do think people – this. Justin, don't get mad. We're talking about Daniel Jones. This is the court. I'm, I'm mad. You know how much I love Leonard Williams. I will, I will 
kill another person for this man. I will. Um, what was I? Well, now I lost my point. Dan, well, let Mike Williams. go. Let let Mike go because you yeah, 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 Mike, go ahead. Uh, Mike, go ahead. I, I just wanted to know real quick: was that Leonard? Uh, not the Leonard. The Deion Lewis play, the one you're talking about, when he was in the backfield and he motioned him to the left side. It was like a third and five. That play, right? Yeah, yeah. I just want to make sure. Okay, no, you they guys are right. That was a really, really Giants. smart. Uh, Smart job by Daniel Jones to read the defense there and fit that into a tight window. I, that was a great play. Yeah, because yeah, they were hiding their coverage and he forced it out of them yeah. and they rolled. Anyways, I don't go watch my breakdown. It was it was I, it was the most fun <laughs> I had doing a breakdown all year. I spent like thirty minutes on it. Um, my thing is, I think people have discounted that type of playing style, Chris, and there's not as much patience for that, you know, because that does take like you, you know that doesn't happen overnight, um, and that's where. That's where I was saying where I was like, we're the like we're the crazy ones. That's where it's like I feel like he has the work ethic to be that guy, and I, I think that's why I got so excited about him, and you know, and his work with Cutcliffe. And anyways, all right, Justin, let's talk about some defensive yeah. tackles. All right, so uh, I feel one of the biggest debates happening probably within the Giants building right now is what in the world are we gonna do with uh, two stud. Defensive tackles slash defensive ends, three, four system. Nobody knows exactly what they are. If you ask their agents, they're defensive ends. Yeah. If you, if sure. you I don't ask, think even Dalvin's agent would say he's a defensive end, uh, but yeah, Leonard definitely. No, the, the, the agents got to try to squeeze out the couple mil. Cause if you say that you're, but if you ask the giants, they're defensive tackles. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a wishy-washy the narrative uh, is depending on, you know, narrative spews, whoever you ask. Um, so really kind of twofold. Twofold, maybe there's three parts of this question, but two main parts of this question. Um, Mike, we'll start with you. Donald Tomlinson or Leonard Williams? Which kind of guy would you choose? But also, again, talk philosophically on which part of the game do you value more? Do you value a guy that can get after the quarterback? Do you value a guy that can stop the run and be a, a plug in the hole uh, up the middle? You know, which kind of which kind of player do you value more? Um, and is the difference in money a deal breaker, even though you may like one player or the other, why you would go with, um, why, with probably th this player would be Dalvin Tomlinson. So take it away, Mike. Well, are we taking money out of it? We're just asking who's the better player. If, if you, if you, why don't you touch on both? Who do you think okay. is a better yeah, player? Yeah. And then money, what makes sense in your yes. brain? Okay. I do believe Leonard Williams is the better player. Um, I do love Dalvin Tomlinson, so not to slight him in any way, but uh, Leonard Williams I like because he plays the run very well, but he also has shown he can get to the passer. We didn't see it much last year. We did see instances of pressure, but now he's actually completing the play and getting sacks, which is awesome. So my problem with Leonard Williams, though, is how much will this guy ask for? Because I'm sure last offseason, the Giants tried to get a long-term deal done with the guy because, you know, they made the trade for him and things like that. Um, they probably wanted to get a long-term deal done. But what type of crazy asking price is Leonard Williams asking for? Does he want $16, 17000000 million per year? I like Leonard Williams a lot. Great football player. I don't know if I'd pay him that much. If we got the number below 14, I'm totally fine with that. So it really depends like what type of number he's getting. Dalvin Tomlinson, I'd have a hard time letting go, but I will say that filling in a, you know, primarily run stuffing defensive tackle is a lot more easy than finding a guy that can play, you know, basically a hybrid, a guy that can go after the quarterback and yeah. play the run. So that can be found in the draft. That can be found in free agency that happens every year. Will you find a guy as good as Dalvin Tomlinson? Probably not, but the drop off will not be as significant as an interior defensive lineman that can also get to the quarterback, which is Leonard Williams. So every man has a price. That's the number one thing, but I think Leonard Williams is the better player. If we re-sign them for a crazy contract, I guess I would have my concerns. But at the same time, he's very durable, doesn't miss games, uh, good attitude, good locker room guys. So it's not the worst thing in the world, but I wish we got him at a good price. Yeah, uh, I – you know what? He's technically on pace for nine sacks, but because he has five and it's the bye week – a lot of Ten. people's brains think think it. Oh, we can we can pass that it's ha that we're halfway through the season. So guess what? He's going to get ten sacks. <laughs> and <laughs> again, spewing narratives to fit to fit our to fit our own uh, to fit our own stance on things. So when's the last time the Giants had a, a ten sack guy from the interior part of the defensive line? Uh, it's been been a very very long time. So Chris, I'll throw it to you. Uh, where where is your mind on maybe philosophically about what you value in the game of football and then Dalvin Tomlinson versus Leonard Williams discussion? It's definitely Leonard Williams in terms of being the better player. Leonard Williams is also a perfect fit for this defense. He's incredibly versatile. You can move him around 
uh, both on the inside and the out. Dalvin, who I love, is is a nose tackle. That's what he is. He's very good at it. One of the better in the league, no doubt about it. Um, I definitely value Leonard Williams higher. And I, you know, I made I made a video on this before the year started. Who are the Giants going to end up keeping? And before the year started, I said Dalvin Tomlinson because I think he's going to be more cost effective. Um, and I didn't think Leonard Williams would be playing this well. I did think he fit the scheme well. I thought he'd have a good year. He's making he's making like 16 already, right, on, on yeah. the franchise tag. So I don't imagine Leo is going to take anything less than that over a three- or four-year deal. That's going to be his asking price. And if the Giants don't give it to him, somebody else will. Um, if he continues to play the way he's playing. He's been great. He's arguably been our best player on defense, if not him, James Bradbury. But he's been up there, him, Martinez, and Bradbury. He's been great. Uh, I like Dalvin Tomlinson, and it sounds like he wants to stay a giant. Dalvin Tomlinson has basically come out and said he'd almost take a discount, paraphrasing a bit, to stay with the New York Giants. As crazy as it may sound, with the way the defense is playing, for the right price, I would think of, I would entertain keeping both because I would want continuity on that defensive line. That's been the strongest point of this defense. Of course, by doing so, it's going to limit you – to possibly bring in a wide receiver or, or an edge or, you know, an outside linebacker free agency. But I would definitely entertain it because that's been the strength of this defense. Leonard Williams is staying. I, I'm almost positive of it. I'd be surprised if he doesn't. And I think we're going to end up overpaying for maybe 16 or $17 million a year. But at the end of the day, he fits well on this defense. To, and, and the proof is in the pudding. Since he's been here, the run defense has been top five, top six in the league. And now, like you said, he's coupled that up with getting after the quarterback. And it is incredibly valuable to have a guy that could do both, you know, that goes overlooked because a lot of people just look at the sacks last year. I think he had the most pressures of any interior defensive lineman in football. He just didn't have sacks. Now he's getting the sacks. He's a really good football player. And that trade, even though I still don't agree with it, doesn't look nearly as bad as it once did. Uh, I, I think Leo will be back with uh, the New York giants. And I am, I'm saying it's almost 50% bolter back right now. I, I really, this is the one Tom, where it's like I go back and forth, but doing some of my homework for this episode, it's like, okay, we're projected at 21 and a half mil cap for the year. You cut solder. You guys told me you saved 10 mil. I thought it was three mil. After June things. 1st. After June 1st. Right, so we got to have to wait after June 1st. Tay would be six mil. The more I think about it, I think we may have to move on from Zeitler or get Zeitler to take a pay cut, which I think Zeitler would be like, I think that's something that is, is possible. But at 12 mil, the more I think that is a little high. Or trade Zeitler. You could trade Zeitler. Don't you still get dead cap on trades? I don't know. I'm so bad the cap stuff. I need like a personal cap person to like explain it. It's only two million though, isn't it? So it's not like the you know worst situation. Yeah, he only, he only has a two million dollar dead cap hit. Yeah. Tyler? Oh yeah. yeah, that's if you trade him. Yeah, yeah. So if we trade yeah. him, obviously, yeah. Sorry, I'm I had a brain fart. Here's where I if I do think there's a path to keeping both, but then that hamstrings like if you bring Logan Ryan back. If there's a wide receiver you want to get in free agency, the more I think about it, the more I think we might not do that. Um, so, but I do think there might be a plan to move on from Dalvin um, because one, they haven't extended him. Like usually if you're going to keep a guy that's on your team, they extend you by then. The Giants usually, and you know, I think Chris definitely, you know, you, you've, you've been a fan for a very long time. Mike and I are a little younger. You know, this is even going back to like the Plax days. Um they love to extend people like when guys are going into their final year, I may have gotten the plaques, the plaques reference wrong, but when they're going into the final year of their deal, the giants, if it, if it, especially if it's a significant player, they love in the summer to be communicating with the, with the agents. And it's not even like Donald Thompson was coming off of injury. So that's why he's playing the last year of his deal. Donald Thompson, they put a C on his Jersey. Now, obviously the management doesn't do that, but you know, the, the organization and the players hold them to a very high regard. Usually players like this, significant players, there's definitely, yeah, there's definitely conversations of them being locked up. Uh, the, the other thing and, and why I, I would lean not to bring back Dalvin Tomlinson. I love Dalvin Tomlinson, um, I, I, but I, I, I could see both ways. I'd be completely fine either way. I'm like 50-50 on this in terms of bringing back both. But you also have other players on your roster that could step in. Like Dexter Lawrence is really good, but you also have B.J. Hill, who I feel if he got an opportunity – could be a good player for this New York Giants team at that position. Austin Johnson, if you bring him back, has been pretty good as well. And like you alluded to earlier, you could find in the third, fourth round, you could find a guy that could do what he does. And like Mike said, maybe not quite as good, but for that extra money, if I'm going to be able to get Allen Robinson or, or Kenny Galladay based off of that, I unfortunately, because I love Dalvin, 
um, he may be a cap casualty. And look See, at BJ would, Hill, right? I mean, yeah. third round pick, very solid defensive tackle. So there's one. BJ yeah. Hill is the reason I would keep Dalvin though. And, and I, like I said, I, I think they're probably going to move on from Dalvin, but I would keep Dalvin because one, he's going to be cheaper than Leonard Williams. Like it's, I, I, I'm pretty confident in that the teams look at sack numbers and sack numbers matter, but I would keep Dalvin because I think he's the only one who really plays that pure nose tackle role the best. Like BJ Hill is a pretty damn good pass. Like he's a, he's a good option. And that was a big reason why I didn't really like the trade either. It's like, you kind of got someone there in BJ Hill, who's a good third man. Like when you have Dalvin and Dex, what's the point? And notice something, RJ McIntosh has been on the roster the whole year and he hasn't been active. And RJ McIntosh is a guy I like. I think RJ McIntosh has good pass production. Go look at his just numbers based on snaps last year. It's like it's the best on the team. Now, he had two, obviously, yeah, it's a small he had two size. sacks. Then he had two sacks. Man, touch yeah, and like two tackles for a loss, two QB hits. Like he, he, like when he comes in, he makes plays every time. And I, and I liked him even out of Miami. I do like Miami, so I'm a little biased there. So I think the reason they have had him on the team all year is they plan to move on from one. But what I would do is Dalvin because he's the only one who is that pure nose tackle. As big as Dexter Lawrence is, he's not a pure nose tackle. And then you let Dex be that number two. It's usually two men out there, but you could do three. Um, and then let BJ Hill and RJ McIntosh rotate and Austin Johnson. Now, I don't think it's a, it's impossible to keep both either, though. And I had this theory that the reason why we're getting these defense alignment and we've seen us be better in coverage is, like, especially against, like, the Rams, who love to do that play action. If you guys have noticed, Mike, I know you watch film. Our linebackers do not bite in the run game like they have in yeah. past years. They're usually like um, there's times in play action where they don't even re- like take a, a read step. They're like get, they're getting back in coverage. And I think a lot of that has been Patrick Graham and being like, hey, you guys up front got to stop the run. Like you guys are in here to stop the run. We cannot have our linebackers coming all up and playing close to the line of streamers to stop the run because we need them in, in um, pass defense. And I think it's made a difference for this defense. So that is what makes me lean to keep both. But if you do, if you if it's one or the other, I, I I say Dalvin, even though Leonard's the better player. The other thing I'll throw into that, if you let Leonard go, you would get a much higher comp pick. You'd probably get a third round comp pick uh, where you wouldn't get much for Dalvin at all. Good point. Yeah. That is true. I, I don't like I don't like these compelling arguments of not of of not bringing back <laughs> Leonard Williams. Uh, I, I don't. I, I went I went hell bent over the off season just on a mission and a tear to you know say the trade was bad. You know, it, we know it, but damn, he's a good player. And I knew I, I knew in my heart of hearts that he was going to get 10 sacks this year. Uh, fellas, this has been too serious of a conversation. Well, I want, I have one more serious question. I, well, well what, is it going to be quick? Cause I have, I want to ask make it a, quick combination right. of, two, you have three players, Logan Ryan, Leonard Williams, okay. and Dalvin Tomlinson. You can only keep two, which one, do you, which two are you keeping Mike? Uh, I like Logan Ryan a lot, honestly. Yeah. I mean, I'm probably taking Logan Ryan and Leonard Williams. Honestly, that's probably the way I'm going about it. Chris, same. Yeah, and mo- if money's not a factor. It's definitely the same. Lo- Logan Ryan. Money is a factor. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> it depends what Leonard goes for. Is Leonard going for 18, or is let's he going- say the the difference is five mil between Dalvin and Leonard. I'm going so Leonard. let's say 14 Leonard. and nine. Yeah. Leonard if it's like me. if it's 15 and 10 or 16 and 11, I'm going Leonard. Um. And I'm going, you have to bring back Logan Ryan. In my opinion, Logan Ryan has been a leader of this football team. And he seems to be a really good guy in the locker room. I would love to have uh, Logan Ryan back. I think we need to bring Logan Ryan back. Um, so I, I will go with those two, Leo and Logan Ryan. Yeah. We said this We said this during the trade deadline. I'm sick and tired of, uh, you know, giving away our, our, our good players. You know, during the trade deadline, if you get something back that's good, you know, maybe you digest it a little bit. But especially during free agency, what, you're doing it for the sake of getting a comp pick at the end of a round? You know, if, if we have good football players on this team, let's find a way to get them back. You know, I know the cap because of the Corolla is in a bad spot um, because there's no... You said the Corolla? No, yeah, the Corolla. That's what I call it. Um, <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I call it. Um, I figured it's been long enough. It's been long enough to change the name up a little bit. Um, but because of the Corolla, the cap's in a bad spot. The league is in a bad spot money-wise. Teams are in a bad spot money-wise. Um, but let's, you know, Saquon, probably not getting extended. Daniel Jones, probably not getting extended for one or another two years. Let's use that little buffer that we have that we probably won't be able to, that we won't have to be able to dish out huge contracts and keep the good players that we have. There's one final question I want to ask 
to wrap us up. And I was, uh, we were talking pre-show. This is not a serious question. And we're going to get sports radio because Bobby Skinner said that this topic Russell was Westbrook sports radio. to the Knicks, yay or nay? No, 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 no. We're not talking no. about that. Not talking about <laughs> I mean, that. yes. This, this week is Thanksgiving. We're putting this episode out the week of Thanksgiving. Is Thanksgiving an overrated holiday? Because I've been going back and forth on this. Mike, I want, I want you to answer this question first. Absolutely not. I think Thanksgiving is one of my favorites, honestly. I mean, you have three games of football, which is the main thing. I'm not like, you know... I don't know. I'm not like a biggest food person, to be honest with you, but I do enjoy turkey. I'm not going to lie. So there is good food there. And like, you just get to honestly relax all day and just watch football. Like the only bad part about Thanksgiving, I don't know if you guys deal with this in your households, but sometimes my mom has to set up for a lot of people and she's a bit moody on Thanksgiving morning. I'll put it that way. That's the (laughs) one downside outside of that terrific holiday. I'm definitely all for it. Yeah, you clearly just you know looking at looking at uh you on camera versus Bobby and I you you clearly do, you don't love food as much as we do. Chris, <laughs> is, th- is Thanksgiving an overrated holiday? I will go. Uh, no, I I love Thanksgiving. It's it's definitely my top two or three holidays. Uh, Mike hit it on the head with the football. I watch all the you know you watch you watch the uh, Lions play every uh, every year. You play you watch the uh, Cowboys and now you got the night game on top of it. So. I am definitely going with Thanksgiving. I am a huge turkey fan. I also love the stuffing. The sides are the best um, on Thanksgiving, Mm. whether it's the mac and cheese, the stuffing, the sweet potatoes. Um, So, no, I will say it is not an overrated holiday. As a matter of fact, it might be an underrated holiday. Wow. Gravy or sauce? What do, what do we, we we call it? Gravy, right? Gravy, all, gravy. Gravy, yeah, yeah. Gravy, okay. gravy, gravy, gravy. But the people right. who call spaghetti sauce gravy are weird too. I know I'm, I know I'm offending like 80% of our audience, but that's what right. me too. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. Snacks, snacks will get over it. Um, Bob, all right, that's all that I. That's really the well, only. He, I, can I ha, can I put my take in there? What no, the hell is going you, on here? No, no, not you. No, you are the type of person that will go against the tide. So I. No, I like hear, Thanksgiving. Oh, come on. Thanksgiving's number two for me. Fourth of July is number one. And part of his process of elimination. I don't celebrate Christmas and Easter. That's true. Hashtag not a Jehovah Witness, though. Um, every, I, that's Whenever I tell people that, that's the first question so, I get. So what, are you a Scientologist, Bobby? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just I'm just a Christian. I don't celebrate Christmas and Easter. I grew up celebrating it, and I just re- – I'm not going to go into the whole spiel. Oh, yeah, don't worry. Even my parents, when they're like, you're not, it's like – you sure you're not a Jehovah Witness? I was like, yes, I am sure that I'm not a Jehovah Witness, mom and dad. Um, but anyways, uh, Fourth of July is my favorite just because it's chaos. I'm a big firecracker, firework guy, as, you know, as people have noticed. And oh, then, yeah. but Thanksgiving because it's just there's really not a ton of expectations. You just hang hang out with the family that you enjoy the most. Like it's not a fan like a fly in, you know, travel vacation for the most part. It's the family. It's your it's your immediate family. And friends, you know, the neighbors come over. And like you said, you just get to hang out and watch football and then have a nice meal. I, it's second for me. Yeah, I, I love Thanksgiving. Wow. I've been going Listen. back and forth. I've been going back and forth. Uh, I, I don't want I don't want to give my takes because I'm not ready to give my take. You know, I'm not yeah. ready to give my take. We don't, we, it would be, God forbid, you know, someone checks this in three years ago and like this hypocrite said he liked Thanksgiving <laughs> well, and now he's have, saying he doesn't. I have every right to change my mind. I have every right to change my mind. Yeah. Every right. I Absolutely. could wake up tomorrow and love it. Based off of these answers, I'm gonna edit this, I'm gonna edit this video in this in this podcast. And I could re-listen to these compelling points that Mike and Chris gave. Bobby, your point your was your point was okay. So then I'll <laughs> change my mind. So uh that that's really the only question I wanted to ask. You know, t- talking that's giants. Great, great question. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate that. It was an good okay topic. question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's a show. Now, when you're done listening to this. Hopefully, you know, just selfishly, I hope you guys like us the most. So you're listening to this one first. But if you didn't, if you did, go check out Chris. We're talking about Dave Gettleman and the offensive line. And then Mike, we're talking about Joe Judge and then wide receiver cornerback two future. If you haven't checked those out, they're up now. Go out. We'll put the links in all the channels. Um, And if you're listening on the podcast app, that's going to be on YouTube. Appreciate you guys. One. We, you know, we'll put the links out there, but to follow you, it's at Mike underscore NYY, Mike. I'm pretty there sure, you right? You got it. Yep. And then we got the DA Entertainer with the H at the end. I mean, we're going to have to, we're going to have to type yours out, Chris, because people are going to get lost. And then 85. Yeah. I don't um, know what was happening when I first started. I, I, I got to change my Twitter handle. I don't know how to do that, but I'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I always, that was my pitch to do is like, Hey, you're the YouTube guy. I'm the Twitter guy. Let's, let's work together and grow. Yeah. Uh, thank you both for coming on. 
Appreciate you. Um, go check out their stuff. But until then, let's go big blue.